our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Thank you for praying. I appreciate that a lot. Russell and Helen are coming now to lead us in some special and inspirational music.
You know, one of the things that I have heard uh, time and again in response to the Ukrainian war is, <clears throat> um, how do I help? And we've been cautioned not to respond to every last appeal for help that some uh, organizations are more trustworthy than others. And, and certainly anytime there's a crisis like this, um, con men and, and people will try to part us uh, from our money and not use it very effectively. So when I stand before you this morning to talk about the America for Christ offering, um, let me tell you this, that only 12% of what we give to America for Christ is overhead. So uh, the cost of these uh, materials uh, to help publicize the offering, the envelopes that you have in your uh, bulletin, the inserts that, that are in your bulletin, uh, that is, uh, represents 12% uh, of the promotional and, and deputation costs. 60% or close to it uh, goes to fund the ministries of what we call American Baptist Home Missions. And that's why this offering is Amer America for Christ, because it stays here in the United States. In fact, 29% of it comes back to the regions. So, uh, now obviously, the CODIS won't get all of that, but some of that will come back to our region, and it helps support the, the ministries of uh, help and healing that, uh, that we have that, that we do. And as a matter of fact, when you look at the, if you could look at the pie chart uh, that I look at right here, uh, almost a fourth of that comes back to the Midwest. So we're really, in America for Christ, we're really giving to support ministry being done in our own nation, and uh, we're supporting ministry in our own region as well. One more little fact, um, when they give grants in situations of disaster to try to help people who have suffered loss in some way, last year, um, through the America for Christ offering, we gave uh, $221,726 in COVID-19 or pandemic-related trials and troubles. So um, our gifts to America for Christ are hardworking gifts, and they're hard at work here in our own country, in our own region, and here in Sioux Falls. So I encourage you to give. You have an envelope in your bulletin, and we'll include that again next Sunday to help you do that. Ask God what he would have you. If you have any questions about that, contact the office. I've got tons more information I can share with you, but uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that today. We're going to turn now to the Word of God, John chapter 10. We're going to continue, actually, in the 10th chapter of John, where we began last week, where Jesus declared to those who were there, I am the gate. And what we're doing in these Sundays in Lent is examining the seven times Jesus used the expression, I am, in John. And you think, well, what's the big deal? Well, the name that God gave Moses for himself was I am. And so when Jesus used that expression, he was cluing people in that he was God and that as God, he revealed a great deal about God. And so these statements are very important to us theologically, but also devotionally as we go through this time of Lent to hear what Jesus said about himself and understand it. So let's take a look at this text. John chapter 10, we'll start with verse 11, where Jesus said, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him, and he isn't 
their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. Just as my father knows me, and I know my father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too, that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. The Father loves me because I sacrifice my life so that I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to, and also to take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. These are the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us take them to heart and by the Spirit understand their meaning. In the first three centuries of the history of the church, Christian artists never depicted Jesus. They never attempted to show what they thought Jesus looked like. For various reasons, instead they used symbols like a fish or an anchor. The most common symbol, however, for Jesus in early Christian art was the image of a shepherd. Now, anyone who wasn't in the faith would look upon that painting or that mosaic, that picture of a shepherd, and think, eh, what's the big deal? It's a shepherd. But his followers knew that the shepherd they were looking at was that shepherd, the good shepherd. What God wants from his people is that every one of us is a living depiction of Jesus. That we are, in our words and deeds, showing who Jesus is. As 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 explains, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. This is how we depict, show, give evidence of the Good Shepherd and His place in our lives. It's through real personal sacrifice to benefit someone else, especially to benefit God. So Jesus is the Good Shepherd. Why? By His own Acknowledgement by his own words, Jesus is the good shepherd because he gave his life for the sheep. He gave his life so that we would not have to die for our sins. Now one thing we need to keep in the back of our mind as we look at this passage is that it comes in a time of very sharp division between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day. By the end of the next chapter, they're going to want to kill Jesus. And so these words, while to us are, are very homey, and they inspire images of the 23rd Psalm, and, and uh, we, we look upon the, the Good Shepherd as being a very <sighs> kind of secure, good feeling. Jesus had some very pointed things to say in John 10. Let's look at the first thing here. The good shepherd defends the sheep with his life. Jesus declared self-sacrifice to be the chief characteristic of the good shepherd. What qualified him to be the good shepherd? Why is he the good shepherd? Because he was willing to sacrifice himself 
for his sheep. Verse 11. Now, back in 1 Samuel in the Old Testament, chapter 17, David told us about what it was like to be a shepherd. It was difficult work. It was lonely work. But it could also be dangerous work. But no shepherd could be reasonably expected to lay down his life for the sheep. If it came to a choice between his life and the flock, any shepherd would have selected his life. Not Jesus. He gave his life. His love went far above and beyond what the usual or average shepherd would have done. And that's what makes him the good shepherd. <clears throat> he tells us in verse 17 that the <clears throat> God our Father loves the Son, loves the good shepherd, because he made that sacrifice. Because God the Father loves so perfectly and powerfully, Jesus was able to make the sacrifice that accomplished his plan. Just like Russell and Helen sang, it was, it, that was the plan. Calvary was not plan B. It was plan A all along. And it was the love of the Father that made the success of that plan possible. So what this is telling us, friends, is that the sacrifice of the Son and the love of the Father are inseparable parts of what Jesus did for us. We can't lose sight of one or the other. They are both, in this passage, cause and effect. Letter C. The Son had the authority to make this sacrifice because it was at the Father's command. Look at verse 18. The Son had authority to do this. Now, Jesus said, I have authority to lay my life down. And I have authority to take it up again. There's some important points of theology here. We'll look at briefly. One, Jesus' sacrifice was at the will of his Father, but he offered himself voluntarily. Look at that word, voluntarily. Jesus gave himself. Second point, nobody killed Jesus. Nobody murdered Jesus. Yes, there were Roman soldiers there who drove the nails in his hands and feet. There was a soldier there who plunged a spear into his side. There were Jewish leaders who conspired to have him condemned and put him on the cross in the first place. But Jesus says here, I lay my life down. Takes it from me. Jesus on the cross is not a victim, but a victor. And by submission to the will of God, by volunteering himself, he provided life for us. The third point of theology here is that Jesus sacrificed himself and resurrected himself by his own authority. He didn't depend on anyone or anything else. And what's impressive here is that Jesus' authority was used to be obedient to the Father's commands. No one took his life. Jesus surrendered it. Because that's what the Good Shepherd does. Now, contrast the Good Shepherd with the hired hand. The hired hand cares more for his own life than he does for the sheep. And when trouble comes, he will abandon the sheep in order to save himself. He will abandon the sheep to save himself. Go back up to verse 12. The hired hand did not have the burden or the benefit of ownership. He did not place any great value on the sheep. He did not have any deep sense of loyalty to the owner of the flock. But here's something interesting. Jewish law required that a shepherd would stand his ground and defend the flock if a single wolf came. If 
two or more came, then you could flee. <laughs> the law allowed you to go ahead and flee if there was a whole pack of wolves, but if they're just one, you'd better stand your ground. So the hired hand depicted here in Jesus' little story is not only um, being guilty of cowardice, but he's also guilty of breaking the law. He's a scoundrel in more than one way. Now, why does the hired hand run away? He does it because he doesn't love the sheep. Jesus said so plainly in verse 13. The hired hand's motive is for money, not for love. And while that's not a, a bad motive, he's not condemning uh, honest work. He is saying this hired hand was giving dishonest work and he didn't love the sheep. Now, who do you suppose the hired hand symbolizes? Pharisees and the other religious leaders. And they're hearing this little story and they're seething with frustration and anger. Because they know that Jesus is identifying them and condemning them for not caring about the people under their charge. The third thing Jesus tells us about the hired hand is that he let the sheep be scattered. Verse 12. Now left on their own, sheep are easy prey for predators. That's just a fact of life. But here Jesus is summarizing the whole history of the nation of Israel in this aspect. That God's people have bad leaders. That they have followed those bad leaders into bad things. And because they had done wrong, they had been disobedient against God, they were punished. They were scattered across the ancient world. And so Jesus is giving the crowd here a little explanation of why they find themselves being scattered all over. It's because their shepherds behaved like hired hands. The third and final thing we'll see from this passage is good news for us. The sheep Follow the good shepherd, not the hired hand. Now Jesus said in verses 14 and 15 that everyone in the sheepfold knows each other. How is that possible? He uses the word know four times in these two verses. It sets a very high standard for our relationships. Believers can know Jesus in the way that Jesus knows God the Father. We can know one another and have a depth and a quality of relationship with each other, similar to the relationship enjoyed by God the Son and God the Father. Wow. Mind blown when you really stop and think about it. Jesus' voluntary sacrifice of his life flowed out of his relationship with God the Father. And so our lives of sacrifice, of submission to one another and to God, flow out of our relationship with him. Jesus is such a good shepherd, he has sheep in another place. Flock, verse 16. Now, the hired hand represented the Pharisees and religious leaders of the day. The good shepherd represented Jesus. The sheep represented the people of God. The sheepfold at this moment represented the Jewish nation. Judaism. The other flock represents the Gentiles. People who were not born Jews. People who didn't have the benefit of the law and the prophets to teach them and the whole apparatus of the Jewish faith. Instead, 
they were born outside that. And God's will, God's desire for all time was to draw all people to himself. And in the Old Testament, or the Old Covenant, he did that through one nation, Israel. But in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, he does that through one new people called the church. And it's our job to bring in people to the sheepfold. And notice this. Whereas the inaction of the hired hand resulted in the flock being scattered, the sacrificial action of the good shepherd brings the flock together. And Jesus made a wonderful promise at the end of this passage. He said there'll be one flock, one shepherd. That's us. We are that flock. We are under Jesus as our shepherd. Now throughout the Bible, shepherds were used as symbols of leadership. Religious and political leaders alike were called the shepherds of God's people. And in fact, God himself is identified as a shepherd in the Psalms and in the prophecy of Isaiah. So to be a shepherd should have been a noble calling in the minds of Jesus' listeners. But they only looked at the isolation and smelled the smell and worried about the ethics of people they didn't know. And as a consequence, in their culture, shepherds were pretty low on the respect ladder. So Jesus is choosing here for himself a role that would not have been prized in that culture, would not have been seen as lofty or wonderful by the people who were listening to him. He chose, once again, a humble role and a biblical role. And here's what shepherds would do for the flock. They would strengthen the weak, heal the sick, bind up the injured, bring back those who have strayed, and have sought out those who were lost. As his followers, we must choose to live the way he lived. Daily sacrifices that are part of our spiritual maturity and demonstrate our love in the way we speak and the things we do. We are followers of the good shepherd. We must be good sheep as well. Amen? <clears throat> We're going to conclude our service today by turning to hymn number 684, either in a bulletin or a songbook. I'm going to ask you to stand and sing. And in this song, we're submitting to the leadership of Jesus. We're saying, Lord, take my hand. Lead me. I'll follow. Would you stand, please?
news with you before we are concluded. Found out this morning that uh, Dwayne and Doris Carlson are this week celebrating their 55th wedding anniversary. Have I got that right? Has it been five years already since we celebrated their 50th? Maybe you ought to check. Are you sure? <laughs> Anyone else having a birthday or anniversary in this month of March? If you are, raise your hand. Birthday or anniversary? Okay. Yeah? Okay. All right. To the Carlsons, to Val, to Rich. Oh, Steve, what? Oh, you were pointing to Val, okay. Well, we got Val twice, okay, good deal. Let's sing a happy special day. Happy special day to you. Happy special day to you. Happy special day, dear friends. Happy special day to you. I think I started that on the wrong note, but that's what you get. You made a joyful noise. That's right. Thank you, Steve. A joyful noise. Now take the hand of the Good Shepherd. Go follow him. He'll lead you to some wonderful places. Amen. Amen.